Good. So welcome everyone to this session about time. So just to tell you a little bit about how the someone, there's some feedback. Uh, I wonder with whom. Um, that I hear. I wonder if I unmute here. Okay, let's see how that works. Uh, we're going to have a conversation about time, uh, Dominic and I. So, and time, how, how we approach time, how we transform time, uh, and how we could use time and this conception, this different conception of time, perhaps in our work as, as, as coaches. Pete, I definitely prefer your video on. So that would, uh, then we're speaking to faces. Ingrid uh, will put her video on a little bit later. So Dominic and I started this conversation a while back, actually more than a year ago, Dominic came and said he's been thinking about time a lot, really a lot. <laughs> Dominic, <laughs> Dominic and my own conversation started earlier because I knew about this book that he wrote, The Ontological Fundamentals of Ethical Management, uh, bringing Heidegger into the organization. I found this book like when then I finally got to read this book and it was fascinating, blowing my mind and also very difficult to understand. So I connected with Dominic and we started the conversation. And uh, then we started to have the conversation about time. And this conversation has developed uh, and picked up speed since December last year, really, Dominic. And uh, the thinking that there's something about time and about how we think about time and how we conceive of time and how, how we in our everyday lives engage with time that could be incredibly valuable for people and that uh, we want to bring to people. And that has been our conversation is how do we, how do we get to this place where we can, where we, you know, how do we transform our conception of time? So the session will be like this. We will have, and we won't have breakout group for the first check-in. Yeah, I think so too. Same. <laughs> no, in a, in a way, it's great to have this conversation with just yes. a few people. It is, yeah, it has it's going to be fabulous. Yeah, we're gonna we we we're going to have this conversation. There's a lot of stuff, stuff that we need to explore. And then Dominic is in Germany, and there was an airport strike, and he got a flight, and he's got to be leaving here at about quarter past five and then we can continue the conversation and that movement is part of the promise we can have a little bit of movement if if we are so moved to do that if it is if the time conversation exhausts itself exhaustion <laughs> is another part of what we are having the conversation about so it's on that note dominic uh, dominic you. That I want to want to want to hand it into your hands. That's great. And thank ask thank you, me. what are we talking about today and why are we talking about this? Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we started this conversation quite a while ago, and we had uh, a, a webinar at some stage, which was a much earlier sort of iteration of the thinking. And um, yeah, so uh, where do I start? So uh, obviously you all have plenty of experience in time management. There wouldn't be a point in sort of adding another gimmick to time management. Uh, what I'm, what I'm and, and what Christo and I and, and a couple of other collaborators who are working on, on this thing and we have now turned it into a course, uh, what we're looking at is what is the transformational potential in in this whole time conversation. Um, and um, I suppose if we look at normal time management, then, um, then we, we see that the, the sort of the fundamental idea of time management is how do I get as much done as possible in as short a period of time as possible. Uh, so if you look at all the sort of gimmicks and ideas, and obviously a lot of them are great. So I I'm, I'm certainly don't want to trash what's there because obviously all of you 
are good time managers in what you're doing and you are coaching others in them managing time to a degree. Uh, and, and so all of this is good stuff. Uh, and obviously what could be wrong with getting more productive? Uh, really nothing, except that there, what we found is there is a background mood and a background situation that we find ourselves in with uh, in this whole time management or almost predicament that we as, as modern people have with time is that it, it leaves, there is a sort of a background music of exhaustion and anxiety. And um, really the first you know, big piece of our work is to tr use the transformational potential in, in confronting that exhaustion and in confronting the anxiety that we're after. And what, what we'll do today is give you a good taste of how you use this experience of exhaustion uh, is, is really a gateway for, a tr for transformation. Um, <laughs> and I found that it made my coaching way more uh, productive when I, when, when, when I use this kind of thinking that I'm going to introduce you to. Uh, and by the way, we're going to make this whole process that we're sharing with you available. In, we, we want to get this thinking out. Feel free to use it with your clients. Uh, there is no copyright on what we're sharing with you. Um, uh, uh, and, and also, by the way, feel free to engage with us any way you feel like on how you want to play with us around those things. So we're, the doors are wide open for all kinds of ways of participating. Uh, and, and, and we also have created a website through which you can get in touch with us on this, which Krista will share with you, I'm sure, in a moment. So uh, we're not going to talk about the anxiety bit. That's another one. And maybe we can even do another session about this. But this is certainly then the sort of big chunk that we're dealing, uh, a big chunk of what we're dealing with also in, in the course. Uh, what we're dealing with today is the exhaustion, is that sort of sense that if we want to get, yeah, so here's the, here's the website, um, is that sense that, you know, we actually have an enormous amount of stuff to do and it doesn't get any less. And the, in a way, the sort of whole experience of time management is exhausting. It's like I get exhausted already if I look at my to-do list and if I look at my calendar and everything that's to, that is to be done. And the idea really is to see sort of how we can transform that. But I suppose the first thing that we need to, we need to look at is sort of where does this trunk exhaustion actually show itself? Or, you know, or, or even how we are sort of afraid of the exhaustion and therefore don't do certain things that would actually be easy for us to do. So I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that you should now just go out and do everything and ignore your exhaustion as a matter of fact quite the opposite is there is a transformational potential in really confronting that exhaustion that's there uh, and by the way when i talk about exhaustion i don't mean the exhaustion that that you feel when you uh, did a 10 kilometer run i have a <laughs> i have a friend who just coaxed me doing into doing the park run and I was really exhausted after those five kilometers because my because my um, my fitness levels are not yet where they should be, <laughs> and and that's not a healthy exhaustion. So I was really I was really finished afterwards. Uh, I but but I was happy. I was mentally alert. I was you know obviously I felt it the whole day, but I was really satisfied, and it didn't. It didn't sort of stop me from saying, I want to do this on a regular basis. It was like, a, you know, a wonderful exhaustion. Uh, what I'm talking about here is more that sort of exhaustion that we feel depletes us, that if we try to get everything done, we sort of have this background music of getting depleted. And then the, our ability to be productive starts to compete with our well-being. Um, and we sort of you know, don't have that experience most of the time when we deal with everything there is to be done, that when we do those things that we are invigorated by it, but that we get depleted. 
And so I suppose the, the first thing I'd like to invite you is, is for us together to explore how this exhaustion that depletes us is present both in our own lives as well as in how it's present in the coaching and the work that we do with clients. I don't know whether you want to share something or have any thoughts about that. Not all at once. So, okay, well, <laughs> having, having fought my way to the front of the queue. Yeah. Um, Hi, Pete. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> Hi. Thanks, thanks for the time in the session. And it's interesting to me, I've just come from a group session, which was supposed to be five candidates. And at uh, eight o'clock this morning was five. And when we started at two, there were only two left. So it's my day of small small uh, gatherings but the previous one was very successful so uh, I, it's a theme that I've certainly been seeing in my coaching clients uh, over the past couple of weeks and whenever I see a theme I always have to reflect well how much of this is my stuff that I'm bringing into the room yes but the theme that I the thing that I see it and it was probably best encapsulated by a coaching session I had this morning where um my client it was uh, the first session after the chemistry session and one of the things he wants to work through is um delays are never uh delays are never acceptable to the corporation but in the discussion that we went what really struck me was they're so busy being efficient that they're forgetting the effectiveness yes. in that they're doing things perfectly well but they're doing the wrong things. And yeah. that's creating that exhaustion because that to-do list is, is just never ending. Okay. But I'm not seeing that reflective space to just say, what are we achieving here by doing this? And, you know, there were multiple examples that flowed from there, which I, I'm not going to, to go into unless it's of interest. But the the importance in terms of time of using step out of the 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 concrete mixer and just see whether it's going in the right direction. Great. Fabulous. Good start. Thank you, Pete, for breaking the ice. Anyone else? Yeah, thanks, Dominic. And okay. Hi. Um, I, what I'm noticing in, in my mind is um, I'm sort of, I'm relating to the exhaustion and I, and I hear that a lot in the client coaching. Um, and time seems to be a consistent thread. And I think it's been a consistent thread for years, right? There's always a case of, as you've said, like people coming in feeling like there's not enough time to do what they want to do and they need to be more productive, they need to be more focused, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then increasingly more and more exhaustion, I think is, is what I'm seeing with coaching clients. Oh. Um, but my, I, so I, I'm relating to that, but my brain is jumping quite quickly to, oh, I'm so curious about what's the thing that's going to transform it. And yeah. And in my experience, I'm just throwing a little tidbit in, I'm coming to presence. And I have no idea whether that's part of, you know, what you're going to share with us. But I know that when I'm, rather than managing my time, when I'm really present in something, I have a very different experience of time. Yes. But that's sort of, that's what's happening in for me right now. Yeah, that's great. And I suppose you could, you could actually summarize all the work that we're doing is, is, is a, I mean, I don't know, a, a new way of getting access to presence with everything that we need to do. So how do you, how do you get, actually get to presence? And that's, I suppose, what I suggest most, most time management does not really securely provide us. Yes, we you know, learn about deep work that you need to take chunks of time to really focus on something. But it sort of seems like the time management always sort of disrupts the presence ultimately in a myriad of ways. And so we're really looking at how can we 
how can we create a breakthrough in this? What I what I hear in both what Kate says and and Pete says is there's this one thing that I should say we are exhausted, but time itself is also exhaustible. It's limited, and uh, it's uh, um, and it's a thing that we must use well. So they can't, there's not enough of that. And then we go into this practice, Pete, as you say, of increasing efficiencies. Uh, and they can they may even be increasing effectivenesses. But, uh, but even so, the, the time remains limited, limited, a limited resource, a limited thing that I can use and that I run the risk of using up. Thanks, Krista. That's great. Ingrid, Rosa, you want to say anything? No worries. Um, and so I want to I want to introduce sort of the first cut at how how to deal with this situation. And I'm suggesting that when you're, uh, I suggest, okay, Morosa, I understand. Thank you. Thanks for letting us know. Um, so I'm suggesting when this sort of depleting exhaustion is the function of playing impossible games or what I'm calling impossible games in the, in the sort of approach that we have developed. So let me give you an example first of a possible game. So if you play any sport, let's say soccer, that's a possible game. And the characteristics of a possible game is it's time limited in, 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 in some more or less clear way, but pre pretty clear. I mean, if you look, tennis can last a little longer or a little shorter, but you, you know that eventually it will stop. Uh, and there are clear rules of when you will have lost and won. And, uh, you know, or, or my five kilometer run is also a game, is a possible game. So I have to run those five kilometers and, you know, and on a good day, I might run it in under 40 minutes and on a bad day, it's going to take me a little longer, but there's sort of a, a, a relatively clear idea and I can just go full blast. I'm fully engaged. I give everything I have and then it's over and I, you know, may be tired, but I'm, you know, it is, as I said, this sort of, healthy tiredness rather than this depleting exhaustion. So if, on the contrary, if you look at uh, having to run a listed company that is, whose task it is to maximize shareholder value, that's not a possible game. So if I'm a CEO of a, of a large company, then um, there is no place when I can ever say I have achieve this if I, you know yes I can do better and worse and maybe I have an idea of how well I need to do not to get fired uh, but ultimately there is really no no way to sort of say I've, I've really gotten my job done because if the task is to maximize shareholder value if you sort of really think this through to its logical conclusion the only moment that you could say I've gotten my job done if you would have created infinite shareholder value in no time at all. And that would be the only moment where you could say, yeah, I've got my job done. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. This is done. Now, we all know that you can't create infinite shareholder in no time. That's just not happening, but it's... Uh, um, you know, and, and, and to play that kind of game depletes us. And I suggest that whenever you experience that sort of exhaustion, the first place to go to is to see what is the kind of impossible game that I'm actually playing here. And that can come in many ways. I mean, in a, you know, in a dysfunctional relationship, you try to please the other person all the time. And you know that there will never be a point where you will say, I've now completely pleased this person once and for all. I'm done with this. I can now do something else or something like that. That's just not going to happen. Uh, that, by the way, I'm not saying that you shouldn't play impossible games. The idea here merely is to distinguish them because you will find that if you have fully articulated an impossible game, then it doesn't have that depleting effect on you anymore. 
Uh, sometimes we have, we play possible games within an impossible game. So I might have a situation where I'm a salesperson and maybe for this week, my target is to sell 10 units. And, uh, you know, that may be a perfectly sort of doable game and, you know, give it everything and sell 10 units and, or, you know, I'm setting out to sell 10 units. And that in itself would be a possible game, but it play, it's, it's happening within a larger impossible game because I know full well if I sell 10 this week, they will say sell 12 next week. And if I sell 12 next week, they say sell 14 the week after. And so the, that sales target happen, that sales targets, which in, in itself is a possible game, happens within a larger, within a larger. A uh, game that actually is an impossible game. And interestingly enough, the way that we've set up time management is itself an impossible game. Because if you say, if the underlying game that maybe was never really fully acknowledged is to get as much done as possible in as little time as possible, the only moment that you would say I've won at this whole time management story is I would if I would be able to get everything that could possibly that should possibly be done done in an instant. That's the only moment that you would say, "Ha, huh, I've 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 won this time management game." The way the way that it's set up right now is it the way that we do time management is depleting and exhausting in itself. And so um, what I want to do is, 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 is share with you an exercise and we will we'll do it right now. Um, Christo, can you put that, uh, that, yep. uh, that document up so I can take you through the process. We're also going to share this document with you because the idea really is to share it and that you can use it and play with it and tell us how it went. Um, um Christo, are you are you winning? Aha. Okay. Good. Great. So in, in this in this process, the first thing is uh, uh, look at the life, look at the area in your life where you experience the exhaustion. I suppose in your coaching, you could use also any area that you work with, with a client to just sort of say, you know, where, where do you experience the exhaustion there? Uh, because this exhaustion is sort of the indicator or the register that, uh, that indicates that there is an impossible game somewhere. And as I said, to resolve it, all it needs is to completely articulate this impossible game. Um, so the next, the next question then is look in this area and see what you're trying to achieve. So it's like, if I'm, if I say I'm, uh, I'm a CEO of a large company and it's a bloody exhausting job. And then, uh, Christo asks me, look in this area, look in your, your job as a CEO, what are you trying to achieve? Then I say, oh, you know, I'm trying to maximize shareholder value. That's what I, that's that's what my task is. That's what the board tells me fundamentally. That's what I need to do. And then the next question is: So, what does success look like? And then I sort of can start to reflect on: So, when when would I have achieved enough shareholder value? And maybe at first I would say, you know, I need to just create better shareholder than my competitors. Uh, but ultimately, maybe that's not really full success. Um, this goes sort of towards the next question. What would be the moment or point when you've achieved what needs to be achieved once and for all? So if you've really fulfilled your job, you know, then I would have to sort of really look at it and take it to the very end and say, well, you know, I only really would have won in my game if I created infinite shareholder in no time at all. That, that's that's on that's the only moment where I could really say, ah, this is completely done. Um, the next question says, besides the goals and targets that you have in this area, is there an overarching game that is being played that, that refers to that 
possible game that you may play in a larger impossible game. So I might say I'm a salesperson and I'm actually playing a possible game every week. But overall, I'm playing an impossible game because whenever I do well, they just want more next time. And I know there is no, no point when, when my sales manager sort of says, you're actually selling enough. It's great. <laughs> You're, you're just fine you keep saying, you know, this is great. Uh, and you can set any target next month uh, or next week. That's also fine. Or at least it would sort of stay the same. That, that would also, you know, not, not create that exhaustion. If you say, look, I can sell 10, 10, 10, 10 a week. And that's actually what I'm going to do on an ongoing basis. That's sort of the same thing as if you play tennis with your friend every every weekend and every weekend you play a game of tennis and it's not an impossible game it's every time it's a possible game and that's fine you you will see that when you move from being an amateur tennis player to a professional tennis player it becomes an impossible game because then it's never enough it's always needs to be more it, it, there's always more you would have to sort of, you know, win all Grand Slams every year, all the time. <laughs> and you sort of say, well, you know, maybe theoretically that's more possible than creating infinite shareholder value in no time at all, but really I couldn't do that either. And there, I will always fall short of that. And then um, it's, it's useful to sort of see what happens when you've, when you've really articulated that impossible game. Because I'm not saying that you shouldn't play impossible games. I'm just saying, uh, if you play impossible games, be clear you're playing an impossible game. For me, being a father is an impossible game and I love playing it. And I know that I will never arrive anywhere. And I'm not playing it as if I could win. I'm playing it with love and affection and dedication but not as a game I can win. It, it's not depleting me at all. As a matter of fact, my interaction with my children are, is, is some of the most mm -hmm. nourishing thing I'm doing in my life, but I'm not trying to get anywhere. And, and that doesn't mean that I'm not, you know, very engaged in it, but I'm not depleting myself. Uh, sometimes you might say in the end, look, I can turn this impossible game into a possible game which is what the last last uh, question of the page is about but it's not necessary that that's up to you to see whether there is a, a possible game that you can play there or whether uh you're just saying look i'm you know i'm playing tennis every saturday um and that's what I do, and I'm having a great time, and uh, that's fine. Uh, so there are lots of areas that do not lend themselves to being turned into a project or a game. Uh, and I suppose in in the course we then look at sort of how do you how do you deal with that with your in in practice. Uh, here we're just looking at the transformation, looking at the transformational potential. Uh, that is provided when we realize we're in this exhaustion about everything there is to be done. Any questions, thoughts? Uh, yeah, buts, how abouts, what ifs? I'm mean, Julia. <clears throat> I was Julia earlier. <laughs> Hi, Julia. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt things. It's incredibly interesting. I'm just catching, catching up with you. You just caught, I think, the most interesting part. So you, there's no excuse there. <laughs> <laughs> All about coming, arriving with the brain in this meeting and not in the last one. <laughs> Dominic, this, this side, this side, this. It's, it's interesting you talk about games <clears throat> and, and and that possible games are, are, are games with boundaries yeah they are and, and they are games with with clear endings mm. and and then there are these impossible games like you you saying uh, you know the 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 impossible achievement games it's yes. impossible I mean, when you refer to something like fatherhood or parenthood or so on, 
Yeah. Uh, you know, in a way, it's not really a game. No. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, you know, if we get deeper into that whole conversation, we're seeing that because we think of time as this sort of linear thing within which we need to achieve thing, everything becomes a project or a game. And the first step that we're taking at this whole time thing is that even if you stay within that linear understanding of time, there are actually things that don't lend themselves to being projects or games. They just aren't of that nature. And if we think that everything's a project or a game, we are depleting ourselves because we, we then think that, oh, we're just not winning because you're not, we're not trying hard enough. Not thinking it through to the end that actually we can't win there. Hmm. You know, my my relationship is 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 uh, in that sense an impossible game. That doesn't mean that I'm not buying flowers and that I'm not making breakfast and that I'm not, you know, doing a lot of those things that sort of keep a, a relationship vibrant and alive. But but if I would think I need to arrive somewhere, I'm just going to drive myself completely crazy. Mm. And I suppose we often find ourselves in impossible games without noticing that that's what we're in. Mm. And the opportunity here is to, um, you know, to notice, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm sort of starting to get depleted in an unhealthy way. I'm not tired in a healthy way from doing all the things I'm doing. I'm sort of moving towards burnout. And that is, for me, the indicator there must be an impossible game there somewhere. And the transformation happens the moment we fully articulate that, that impossible game. Hmm. You can obviously do lots of things with it afterwards. I'm not prescriptive. You can say, oh, great, I'm playing an impossible game. Let's keep playing it. I, I obviously will be engaged in a whole different way if I know it's an impossible game because I'm not, because I'm not always hoping that I'll arrive somewhere. Mm. I, I'm just curious and I'm coming in winging it because I don't know the full story, but winging is in my nature. Um, I'm just wondering about, so um, you can fiddle with impossible games and make them possible by changing the time frame, by breaking them up into bites, by making them have quantitative outcomes. And I'm Wondering if these questions, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know how I'm relating to this because I'm wondering if it, yeah. So like leaders, especially at a technical level, they relate to projects and events. Lovely. Yeah. And I know many leaders who organize their life around that. And then these long non-checklist functions, um, which are clearly depleting people and are unrewarding. And this is suggesting that if we transform them into possible games, they will become more rewarding and less exhausting. Yeah, well, I mean, so... Um, um, so if you look at to-do lists, to-do lists, yeah. the way that we set them up are an impossible game because they just are actually endlessly getting longer. So where I'm starting with this is, is there exhaustion? Is there some unhealthy exhaustion? And that's what I'm interested in transforming because mm -hmm. I've seen that if I, can, if I can transform that sort of exhaustion in my coaching, it goes a lot faster. My product, if I confront them in my own life, I'm getting a lot more creative and productive and well. And it doesn't feel like I'm pitting sort of my well-being against my productivity all the all the time. And uh, so I'm in a in a whole different space, so to speak. So the point for me is, well, if the, you know, if with your tech leaders, there is no exhaustion, fabulous, great, they, you know, and some people are actually not exhausted. So uh, the, the, the register, the indicator for why this distinction of impossible games is relevant is because there is a presence of exhaustion, of this sort of unhealthy exhaustion. And I'm saying that the transformational path to resolving that, that exhaustion is by 
unearthing that impossible game that's be that's mm -hmm. that, that 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 one is mm -hmm. involved in there, whether it's my me or or a person that I'm working with. Mm. Uh, and, the, and the process is sort of a, an opportunity to articulate that as a coaching process, and we've we've put it as a as a as a document that we'll we'll share here. I don't know, Krista, have you downloaded it? I must, it? I must just drop it. I'll drop it in the in the chat box. Yeah, so you can download it for yourself. Play with it. If you have any suggestions for how it works, how to change it, mm. would be great if you shared it with us. So the point, really the point is, is there somewhere exhaustion that is unhealthy, that is depleting me, that is not invigorating, you know, that is uh, uh, all of those kinds of things that are not good. And, uh, and I'm saying the opportunity in freeing yourself in this situation is by drilling down and where, where is the impossible game that depletes. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You're saying yeah. that it's the the impossible game stuff that is more depleting than normal jobs. Yes. I mean, I certainly for myself have worked very hard on stuff without being depleted. And then yeah. there are other stuff when I'm actually not even working so hard, but it really drains. Um and I'm not, and I'm not suggesting that now everyone should work day and night. And if you don't play an impossible game anymore, you can just, you know, work 24 hours a day. Uh, that's that's not what I'm saying. Is I'm just saying that actually there is a more deeper existential level that this exhaustion comes from mm. than just working hard or not working so hard. I mean, yeah. I you know. Of, of course, it's like with the five kilometer run. If my friend would have suggested we run a marathon, that would have destroyed me, of course. But the five kilometer run, I was really finished afterwards, but happy finished, fulfilled finished, uh, in a way that I said, I want to do this again, even mm -hmm. though I was really tired. And, 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 and there are other things like most people's jobs is mm. they can't wait for retirement because it's not mm. giving them the tiredness where they say, and I can't wait to do it again tomorrow. Mm. Can I ask another question? Or am I sure. hogging? Am I being yeah. useful? Go ahead, yeah, please. Check. I'm happy to. So, so there's something in the unbounded nature of these problems that is exhausting to humans. Yes. And is it some level of, dare I say, hopelessness? I suppose that that is certainly a dimension. It's like you you know, it's like being in a hamster wheel, uh, hoping to arrive, and and thinking if I just there must be something wrong with me because I'm not arriving. Oh. Now, if oh. I go to the gym and I sit on the treadmill, that's really the same as being in a hamster wheel. But I'm saying, you know, I'm going to I don't know to ten kilometers at this at this. Uh, uh, sort of incline and whatever, and you know, and I'm around, and and I have you know made it made it a game, and and, uh, and the other thing I can do for a Saturday outing with my bicycle, and I'm just going to ride around the afternoon. That's an impossible game, but I know that it's an impossible game. I'm not trying to arrive anywhere. I'm just having a really great time riding my bike around. Uh, Yes, and that's lovely about time because the one's in the present and the other's in the future. Yeah, I suppose the question is whether that, as you say, is is whether that future gives me if if it's if the future gives me a game worth playing, it actually throws me back into the present. It, if it if it's a real game and it's an impossible game, it really it really sort of disorients me and depletes me, and and I'm mm. not present. Mm. And then therefore there is then, a, you know, you are then ultimately, despite your efforts, not as productive as you could be. You're mm. not as well as you, you're not really well, and you're not really out there being creative. Uh, and I suppose those are the qualities that are needed more and more and more. Because mm. that sort of hamster wheel type story uh, mm. uh, is, is not what's needed, really. Yeah. It will be less and less needed in the future. And with AI, even less. 
Yeah, so it kind of really pulls us back from an outcome orientation to a process orientation and being in the now as a way to survive chaos. I mean, not, not that that's news to anyone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Krista, should we do the exercise? Um, yes, sorry, I, I'm just going so, so, Shall we do the exercise? I'm like, I, just because the present came up and the idea of the now came up, uh, I was wondering your thoughts on that. And then just because retirement came up, I was thinking, well, isn't retirement making the career game into a possible game or... Well, I mean, I think that the thing about retirement is that in, in most jobs, we pay impossible gains and we just hope at some stage to get out of it. It's not like, oh, great, then it's done. Uh, in, in, I mean, I suppose if you're 25 and you're saying, and I have 40 years ahead of myself, I don't know whether that's a possible game either. That's just too long. That's just sort of, you know, and there is no sort of what constitutes winning and all of that kind of stuff. It's too long. It's, it just doesn't work as a game. So the, the thing is that for the most part, we're just trying to get off. We're just sort of figuring out when can we jump off the hamster wheel because mm. it depletes us rather than having a way of being on the hamster wheel that either is enjoyable and satisfying because we know that this is an impossible game and it's just sort of, Oh, let's run. I mean, like, it's great. Like go to the gym and be on the bicycle or, or ride around in the park on your bicycle uh, for the weekend. You, you're not trying to arrive anywhere, exhausting yourself and never know when you're actually going to arrive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you either turn it into a proper game or you're just saying, I'm enjoying the ride and I'm, and I'm engaging like that. And that doesn't mean that you don't do a lot. And that doesn't mean that you're not productive is like with my children that's an impossible game and i love being engaged in that but i'm not trying to arrive anywhere and it doesn't deplete me one bit one of the thoughts that came up in our conversations uh, about about linear time and the desire to turn to turn whatever it is that we do into projects or into games is that uh, is that, is that this turning of whatever it is into game, impossible or impossible, is in a way a way to play with linear time so that linear time is not this totally overwhelming kind of uh, exhaustible, inexhaust, inexhaustible, exhausting thing. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I mean, that's sort of the easiest part of the course because we are used to thinking in linear time and that there are sort of, you know, uh, time spans there and that uh, if, if we sort of don't define them properly, you know, and if we mistake a possible game, an impossible game for a possible game, that sort of, you know, is, is, is not such a, such a difficult thing to grasp. Uh, and uh, I found that it makes an enormous difference in my coaching when I look with my clients uh, drill down and where is the impossible game that you're trying there and by really spilling out what in actual in the final analysis would would succeeding mean and of course like in my you know in my relationship I'm there's no there is no final succeeding that doesn't matter I'm having a great time <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know I'm, and I'm doing all kinds of things but if I sort of think I need to now have arrive at the perfect relationship that drives me completely dilly uh, uh, and I suppose it's the same with careers there's always more to go and if you sort of say I need to arrive somewhere and uh, you know most people are actually then even if they have a goal they're frustrated when they arrive there because they <laughs> It's not what was made out to be. But for the most part, we are thinking we're playing a possible game, depleting ourselves, getting frustrated. We're not getting there, putting even more effort into it, depleting ourselves more, never arriving. Uh, and, and, and it's not nourishing. And really the distinction is, am I playing a possible game or am I playing an impossible game? 
I don't know how you want to proceed with this. Do you yeah. want to Let, shall we, you shall we just discuss it or you can yeah. you know mm -hmm. take take that sheet that we have shared with you? Yeah. Uh yeah, and share. We, well, this is our website. Yeah, I wanted to share something else. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I'm wondering. I think if we if we if we play through this thing and and kick it around and maybe throw some of the some of the less obvious impossible games into this, um, because I, I guess in some ways there are, you know, you know we we identify the sites of exhaustion, um, mm. like like is it the case almost of are they you say areas in our life where we experience exhaustion what kinds of areas relationship areas work areas you're still there though. i'm still there <laughs> yeah i don't know how does everyone feel you want to yeah i mean i don't want to force uh, you know for, force people to do this exercise now it's it's fine so we yeah. you know uh, if you want to we can uh, yeah. we do have time to do it i'm almost curious dominic and i know it's a bit of a departure from our plan oh sure, sure. <laughs> easy and uh, i'm curious now just for the conversation because we talk about exhaustion and exhaustion is this is this is this core state that we that we find ourselves in quite often in in this late stage of exploitation and uh, extraction that we live in where time is the last extractable resource <laughs> and it's there's 24 7 everything and uh, and but with that goes so, so that's that's the state of exhaustion but just in, in, in the rest of our exploration, the next thing that we will explore after this is anxiety. And anxiety is really a core theme that runs through, through all our work in uh, existential coaching and working with existentialism, et cetera. You, and also just because the future has appeared in the conversation. So, uh, how do you want us to move ahead with that, Krista? So, I want to know anxiety. What about anxiety? And I know anxiety's got to do with this, with this future that is uh, into which we are thrown all the time, so that we don't return to the present. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to go into that. Obviously, we won't be able to cover it now in the in the sort of limited time that we have. But I suppose I, so I have explored this thing about anxiety lots in the last two years um also because I, I i went through a relatively difficult time in my life and there was lots of anxiety but i realized that anxiety is sort of a you know a, a, there is a sort of an existential anxiety that's that's latent with us all the time and sort of rears its its head at different times and i sort of looked at the what is the the temporal, the time underpinning of this anxiety. Um, and to start to understand anxiety, first we need to distinguish fear from anxiety. So fear is about something very specific, while anxiety is about a sort of, a, I don't know, dim sense that at some stage, this whole thing, this whole show comes to an end. This is sort of existential death kind of thing, is when it all collapses, when the whole, you know, whole thing falls apart. There, and we don't have a really clear idea, uh, uh, which really disables us from, you know, addressing it directly. So we have this sort of dim sense of where, in a way, time for us ends when does this all end in 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 an existent we're talking death in an existential sense here and mm -hmm. i suppose in the course we 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 take take this apart in a much more practical way so that it becomes clear what the transformational potential is in in this thinking mm -hmm. um so it, it's 
the thing that we're afraid of is some sort of world collapse. And the opportunity is, again, just like with the impossible games, to really take this apart. So let me maybe start this, this, this process of thinking from a different angle. That it will not be a strange thought for you when I say that who you are is given by the future that you live into. Is that if you look at how you feel, you know, most, if you look at traditional psychology, you would say you're a product of your past and you need to analyze your past and that's how you deal with all your issues and and uh as a thought experiment i'm proposing the exact opposite not that the past doesn't play any role anymore i'm not saying that but that actually we feel we feel and think and be uh, depending on the future that comes towards us if i'm if it's simply if it's friday afternoon i feel sort of relaxed and it's all good and i can't wait to you know for what happens next. And there are all kinds of things that I'm looking forward to. And I'm still working though. So the actual present situation is not necessarily that great, but what I'm looking forward to makes me feel really happy. I'm, I'm sort of relaxed and happy and you know do my stuff and all of it is good. Compared to Sunday afternoon, when I go into my Sunday afternoon depression and in the present, there's nothing that sort of uh, is is a problem. Uh, I'm having a Sunday afternoon off. I'm, you know, maybe even doing nice things, but it's sort of there is this sort of depression that sets in, and it's it's because of what comes to me from the future that yeah, this will end now, and then and then I need to go back to work, and I have all these things in my to do list for Monday morning, and maybe I should already start to do some of those things, and you know all of that. So, as an explanation of who I am is the future that comes towards. Now, who I really am in the final analysis is where this all ends in the future. If I want to know my way of being, one, one access is to see of where do I sort of maybe use the word subconsciously without ever having really looked at it, where do I sort of fear that this will, will all end? Where, where, what is that moment when my life actually falls apart finally? Like when I, I don't know, run out of money and I, you know, it, I stand and sort of have this, if I look at my anxiety and I sort of look at what is that end state that could explain how where this anxiety comes from. Uh, I might paint a picture of standing in front of the ATM and I need to get home and I need money and it says, sorry, insufficient funds and I've now run out of money. And, and if I work my way towards really confronting this sort of end state, it, it's, it's a, a similar logic to the impossible gain. It just allows me to own what gives me my way of being. And I, and I then can deal with it. I can, you know, it, does, it, it loses sort of its defining power for me when I, when I go all the way there to that end that in really ultimately gives me who I am. And I suppose most of us don't want to look there. Most of us never look there. Most of us don't know that that's where where to look to to to, uh, to sort of understand who we are. It's it's a function of that that existential death that we're living into. I mean, obviously, this is not this is you know this this is what gives us the orientation. It doesn't mean that that will ever happen, but that it means that that gives that that idea of of death, whether it's physical death or just like. My, that's when my life finally has fallen apart, whether it's my business collapsing or my health collapsing, or um, I don't know what it is. It's, it's sort of when that, for most popular people, it has something to do is when their identity would completely be demolished and they wouldn't know how to orient themselves anymore. And it really feels like time ends. And, you know, we'll go deeper into that is why, why does this feel like? Gee, that's the end of time. 
uh, that's when it all falls apart. It really feels like that's when time itself would end for us and we'll go deeper into why that's so and how to how to work with this and 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 uh, explore how we can use that to liberate us because the moment that I have are clearly articulated, then I can play around with it. Then I can see what gives me who I am. And uh, it's it's no longer, it, then I can own it rather than that it owns me. So yeah, there's another process for that, but we won't have time for that. Yeah. Well, thank you for that very yeah. success. Take on going. anxiety and uh, yeah. anxiety and death and the end of time. <laughs> yeah, and as I said, is I, I found it remarkably, I mean, I found it super exciting to play around with just those two concepts, the exhaustion given by playing an impossible game that we haven't really fully articulated, and the anxiety that's given by a notion of where does this all end, that, you know, <laughs> is actually a problem for my coaching. Because I'm getting done in two sessions what I used needed to use 15 sessions for. So I may need to need to charge people differently, not by the hour, but by the result. <laughs> <laughs> because I find that if I put it into that context, a lot of stuff just resol resolves itself. Uh, and it's much easier than to work with whatever whatever else is left there. Mm. And, and, and just to give you an idea, that, so that's the, we're dealing with this kind of stuff in the first four sessions and, and, and then different notions of time. And then in the last four sessions, we make it much more practical. And, and as I said earlier, the idea is to give you all of those processes in a way that you can continue working with them. Because obviously if you, get exhausted and you transform it, that doesn't mean that there aren't other areas of your life where they, they are, which are also a source of exhaustion and where you then say, I need to have either a you know, sheet of paper where I can do this process with myself or even better, I find a friend who has, has you know, can work with this with me mm -hmm. and we can sort of take this apart together. Um, and, you know, and and obviously the idea is to empower you to do this with your clients and and you with your friends and family. And I find that the more I work with this, the more it just becomes part of how I talk to people. Is that is sort of, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Where will this all end? Uh, and it's it it it's it has a remarkable uh, a transformational potential. I find. Sure. Um, I'm loving this. It's very exciting and very useful. I'd love to, I don't know if you've got a case study that you could share with us on how you've worked with this. Well, I can tell you, uh, I can tell you a, a client of mine that I, I'm working with right now in a very simple, in a very simple way, he, who had a, um, and so I've given you sort of big, big impossible games right now, but they're also sort of really simple, simple areas. Like, so I work with this client who's, who says, I need to, I need to fire this person because the person is really not performing anywhere near the standards to where they need to perform and is dragging the whole team down. And I'm sort of trying this and I'm trying that and I'm trying the other and I'm at my wits end and yeah so and and i was working with with him uh through you know what 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 you know what what are you trying to achieve and uh he said the thing that i'm trying to achieve is that she actually completely understands why her performance is not good enough and why she needs to go and you know, that's a version of an impossible game because you, you will never necessarily come to a place where someone gets this once and for all. They, she might say today, yeah, sure, I understand I don't perform sufficiently, but who knows what she's going to say tomorrow. And that if you, you know, if you, if you try to get to a point where she gets this once and for all, you'll be busy for the rest of your life. And the only thing that will save you is dying. Uh, well, if you if you realize, he, he said, and then I realized that 
ultimately I need to I need to let her go. I I'm going to make this as sort of humane and compassionate and easy to digest as possible. But I know that it's it's you know she might or might not completely agree with me. That you know if if I make myself if I set myself the task that she will agree with this once and for all, it's not going to happen. It, or you know or, or or at least he. He, he has played this game and he's just stopped playing the game. <laughs> what happened next is she comes and says, I'm resigning now. Because I suppose, look, there, I mean, obviously that was a sort of a um, transactional analysis type game, not the kind of game we're talking about where you hook each other into. And that's, I suppose, what we do a lot is we hook each other into impossible games without being clear that we're giving each other impossible games. And so, I mean, I'm not saying that this now makes all other processes sort of uh, uh, meaningless, and this is the only one, but I found this an incredibly powerful entry into dealing with lots of issues. Thank you, that's great. Yeah. I'm just on mute because there's going to be a really loud noise in the background here. I appreciate that case study. That's very useful. And in fact, one of the things I'm dealing with at the moment. So thank you. Yeah. And as I said, is I'm sort of, you know, keen to stay engaged with you. Um, uh, Crystal will share our email addresses. Uh, you can go onto the website and there is a place to communicate with us there. And we are offering our first course uh, in um, starting middle of May. Uh, and uh, because it's our first course, and I'm, you know, I see this this call as a sort of call among friends. We're giving everyone who comes through those channels a fifty percent discount because we want to get this going, and we want to get it going with the right kind of people. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, please stay in touch with us. Let us know what, how, you know, if you're interested in. Uh, engaging in any way further, whether you want to do the course, get trained to do the course, it's, to have informal explora explorations, whatever it is, uh, reach out and obviously we'll, we'll sort of see what, what, what we can do. Thank you, Dominic. I know you have got a plan yeah. to learn. Them in to in two catch. minutes, I need to get in the car. <laughs> You Thank need to make friend. sure this is a and possible it, game. <laughs> it is a very possible game, and it's far from certain whether I'll win. That's the thing. A possible <laughs> game, you can win or lose. <laughs> yeah, I'll either really... win or lose, though. I've given myself enough time that is reasonably to be expected that I will make it on time. So uh, 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 that's fine. <laughs> and I suppose... You know, it, 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 it sure goes right into what we're doing and how do you then deal with this kind of a situation? And it's sort of, it's actually interesting that you say this because if you would have talked to me three years ago, I would have been completely frantic right now. And, and I find myself not always not frantic, but a lot, 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 lot less. That's good. Okay. I well, hope to hear from travel. you all in one way or another. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I had a fabulous time with all of you. So thanks for thank being here. Thank you, Dominique. Thanks. Thank you, Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Well, there goes Dominique. So questions, things that come up with, for you and um, yeah, anything. And because we're so small, I'm sure we don't have to stay longer than we need to stay. Also, because uh, we are talking about time and we don't have to be the slave of the clock. Yeah, thanks, Christo. I mean, re yeah, really useful to have. Uh, I, yeah, I love the notion, the exhaustion notion of exploring how one might be playing an impossible game. I couldn't, I mean, I think it's quite useful to do the exercise, but I couldn't think of 
anything that actually I relate to, but I could see how it would be very useful with clients who are sitting with so much exhaustion. Um, and then and the anxiety one, um, I, I mean, I know there's more to it that he, you know, that he didn't get to. Um, I find it super interesting. And I find it super interesting in the context of my living with my husband who like has explored this incessantly, this, this, this anxiety of where does it all end and the final end. And like, he's, he's very in that exploration and I haven't seen the anxiety come off. <laughs> as he's into it. So I guess I'm sitting with that and wondering, like, what Dominique, you know, um, what what more there is, like, to explore there that will, as he says, you know, his, ex yeah, his anxiety is coming off. But, you know. That is, that is a question I also have, is, is, is is if the exploration of anxiety is in itself anxiety provoking to a certain extent. <laughs> you know, the same way that time management is uh, exhausting. Mm. Mm. I don't know if this is useful or relevant, but I've been exploring um, versions of microdosing mm. things. Um, and it took my anxiety away completely. And I actually found that my care for the we instead of the care for the us uh, the me so my care for the me went up um and a lot of my anxiety was about other people and actually it was a little bit of an ubuntu emotion it was keeping me in the we hmm. Because when I had absolutely no anxiety, it it was very much like I'm all right, Jack. See you later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was such an interesting. I just did it for a brief patch of time, and it was so interesting to see how my anxiety actually was keeping me connected. Mm -hmm. So now I'm feeling more positively towards my anxiety. Mm -hmm. Now I've been able to reframe it as my ubuntu kind of emotion and, and the bit that's going to keep me with people rather than you know uh, the other part of me that threatens to take over which is the recluse mm. did you did you did you find the what have, what the disappearance of the anxiety that it was uh, um almost like an anxiety analgesic or an mm. Or, uh, or a numbing of the anxiety yeah. took it out uh, at that level. Yeah. 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 And that is kind of what it's, I suppose it can do different stuff for different people, but it just, it wasn't even a numbing. I was feeling enjoying the world, but I could just look at the world and go, oh, like, oh, you've got problems. You know, like coaches should instead of, oh, you've got problems, which is how I do it. And, um, you know, it was a nice break. Mm. But I, I worried if it's not, you know, just another thing of individualism that's going to help us fragment as people rather than come together. You know, if we're only kind of just there looking after our inner worlds, it's really shifted how I think about self-care. <laughs> hugely. Like I'm not so sure I'm going to hand it out as a prescription so freely anymore. That's interesting. <laughs> really, just to clarify, what are you not handing out so freely? The self care. Um, yeah, I think I think us as coaches, we encourage a lot of self care, and this individualism in the world means we all like trying to care for our inner worlds, and we forget that we need to be caring for the 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 we. Mm. Um, and, you know, this whole, I'm, I'm on a bit of a roll on it at the moment that, um, you know, instead of us learning to tolerate anxiety, we're finding ways to avoid it. And, and actually that means we're not exposing ourselves to the pain of other people. Um, and, and I think that's how we're going to stay together as countries, nations and the world is if we keep exposing ourselves to other people's pain instead of like going, I'm all right, Jack. I'm having a lovely time in here. 
I don't know. I'm I'm a bit all over with this. I will write something, but you know, I'm sort of feeling like, yay, anxiety's got a role. I never really understood how incredibly beautiful it could be. I don't know if that makes any sense. Or yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm really getting what you're saying. But it sounds really definitely interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, I can, no, I can relate to it because, uh, because uh, in, a, in a certain way, <clears throat> in a certain, if I look at myself, but anxiety is not really is is not what I about what what awaits me only. It uh, is usually a, around things that awaits those around me and. Uh, responsibility that goes with that and if i can execute on that or fulfill that responsibility or not yeah and uh, and then that's where it's it's running it's not this um also not this thing of anxiety is this fear that i'm not going to reach my potential you know the yeah. that interpretation of kierkegaard that i have all this potential and possibility which is which is in a way quite selfish and it's like oh my potential, all this stuff about my potential, but it but it but it is about what you have already brought into the world and find into the world and uh, and need to support in some way. Yeah, I think that's right. So most of my anxiety comes out of relationships to things and people. And so the microdosing took that anxiety away. And then I was like, hey, this is cool. I'm all right, Jack. But then my sort of empathy didn't seem to swing into action. It was more like, oh, you're over there and you're having a difficult time. Well, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who knows how these things work? suppose maybe the questions there might be like a coaching questions like where does most of your anxiety come from um, is it like Krista and I with regards to relationships or is it something about health or I don't know intra psychic I wonder, yeah I wonder if the uh, if the instinctual subtypes um of like a, like an impact on where your anxiety is located. Lovely idea. Mm. So me, I'm one on one. I'm fussing about my one on one relationships. So my intuitive response to your question, Christo, and it's based entirely on intuition, is I'm sensing it may come from the repressed instinct. Oh. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And I have no, I have no idea why I say that, apart from the fact that was the first thing that came to mind, as you were saying. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. My repressed instinct is social. My repressed is self-pressed. Mine social. Social. Rosa is. Do you say at times when anxiety is exposed, we feel threatened? Yeah. Mm. Huh. That's really interesting. I think we need to go and do some research. Hey. Do you find a relationship in in in, in your in your world between your your when you feel exhaustion and anxiety? For me, for me, the the anxiety that comes from exhaustion is that there's is the depletedness and the not able to any longer face face whatever it is that is coming. The hopelessness. Mm. Mm. Hmm. 
I'm still sitting with like Pete's comment and I I wonder if anxiety doesn't come from both our strongest instinct or natural orientation as well as the repressed one. Mm -hmm. Because we we've developed that that whatever our, our, our stronger one is because there is like something that was missing there, right? And which keeps us, and it's quite it like it locks us in, keeps us quite like hardwired to look after that need. So I noticed I noticed for myself both anxiety in the repressed one as well as the strongest one. If there's mm. something out of place in either of those, mm. yeah, and I, I notice mm. anxiety with both. Yeah. I mean, I just feel so right what you're saying for me. Uh, Self-praise is more like in the middle one. And that one seems to just tick over. Got mm. those extra cans in the back room, content in that way, you know, prepping just a little bit. Um, <laughs> but it's the other two, you know, like my most exhaustion comes from working in with my partner and my child that that combination is you know meeting needs in that context the group I know they're always going to throw me out anyway based on my childhood experience but you know I suppose I'm always kind of waiting for them to do that again to me hmm. I have group in the middle social hmm? so for me that's that's also not something that's usually hugely stressful most of the time. But what is stress and anxiety pro provoking are the self pressed things. And then the way that the self pressed things can impact the SX things. Mm -hmm. So if I'm like running low on the resources and I can't take care anymore, then it, then it starts to interfere here in the space where my primary responsibilities lie towards people, towards the the close one-on-one -on -one connections. Hmm. So it makes it, it does ring true about the uh, about the blind instinct. Mm. 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 I, I still find uh, Dominic's idea of this 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 um, present self given by the future very very thought provoking, very provoke provocative, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the self given given by the past, and uh, <clears throat> and that and that perhaps in there is not is not the idea of 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 getting rid of anxiety, but of the works coming to terms with it. Mm. It's like death anxiety. It's mm. not, uh, or, or, or just be, being towards death. Death is, is it, it is what gives the, the self, but that in itself is not, um, that doesn't mean that the anxiety around it disappears. Hmm. But the, the befriending, that's the word that's popped up for me. It's like a befriending of anxiety. And I couldn't help thinking when he was talking about the, the you know, our, our um, self being more shaped by the future or the past. Like I think that, correlates with different Enneagram styles, right? So like as a four, I feel much more shaped by the past. But when I work with Enneagram seven, it feels much more shaped by the future. So I don't know, yeah, it's a yeah, interesting notion. Yeah, interesting how different Enneagram styles encounter anxiety mm. and in and encounter future and past mm. this weirdly weird thing present this weirdly elusive thing called the present <laughs> 
Well, uh, I can't remember exactly where it was in in the session, but I was also wondering about the impact of leadership maturity. Um, you know, I didn't make a note of exactly where it was, but that just really resonated because I I sense that um, there's a rich exploration in that as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, just to sort of throw in, I, I don't think those late stage people get over their anxiety so easily. Mm -hmm. um, they just live with it better, perhaps. Don't have to deny it. Um, yeah, yeah, the feeling that I, I had, to, Julia, just to elaborate more was, uh not that they they don't have anxiety but the anxiety arises from different things and mm. is experienced differently mm. so what makes one one stage anxious may just be you know totally oblivious to another stage and vice versa mm. yeah. i mean who's the the danish cook god said the trick about life is to be anxious about the right things Maybe you do get anxious about the right things. I mean, I've had a day of what seems to be people who are getting and clients who are getting anxious about the wrong things, like, um, giving their lives away to a medium term deadline, giving up their youth, their life, their relationships with their children on like a medium term deadline. It's it's just so fascinating. And you look at that system and you know there's no ways they can get out. Unless mm -hmm. they leave. But now they're really addicted to all of the benefits of being in the system. You know, like almost actively putting like your anxiety into deadlines. I know I've done it in my child rearing as well. Sort of like maybe when I should have been watching developmental goals, instead I was busy delivering workshops. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's for me that uh, um, <clears throat> getting in the game and then playing this game and then not being able to get out of the game because of the way that you have trapped yourself in the game. Mm. Uh, it's another dimension of, of impossible. Um, mm. To the ex You've now set yourself up for a lifestyle and a way of, a way of engaging with the world that, that is extracting uh and and that will continue to extract more because that is in the nature of that game is is, is increased effectiveness at extraction and, uh, and you cannot get out of it because you have been hooked into it's like you have your own mainlining whatever it is and you need someone to keep those thingies on those keep them open so that can keep running in. Mm. And that, that cannot but lead to exhaustion and all sorts of destructive distraction. Mm. I love that. I, I love the word exhaustion because it really literally is just the ends of extraction. Is there's nothing left to extract? <laughs> Exhausted, depleted. Mm -hmm. Well, is that the conversation?
Let's take this half hour as a special gift. Yes. A special gift on a day there that has very few half hours. <laughs> if I could just share one thing um, about my journey over the last hour and a half or so, I came into it quite energized. And similar to Kate, when you said, um, you know, you're not really relating to those questions, but you can see it in the clients, uh, I felt the same. But then I noticed as the session went on, deep, deep yawning from my side. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm not pondering where's my blind spot or where are my blind spots, probably more like it. Because I genuinely wasn't feeling that before I came into the session. And mm -hmm. ironically, I'm, I'm back out of it now. So my energy cycle has done a, a, a big U in the last hour and a half. Mm -hmm which I find really interesting. I'm still sort of pondering mm. on it. I've noticed the same, Pete. I've had the same experience. Coming in quite energized and it's done. And now that we're, okay, I've got half an hour to go and do something. It's like... <laughs> Another thing that we squeezed into the day. <laughs> no, not, the, well, more like go and move, do the movement outside in nature. Mm. That's it's calling. <laughs> nice. Watch what looks like a, going to be a beautiful sunset in about 20 minutes, half an hour. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, over already. Mm. Thank you, Christo. Oh. Yeah, yes. thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. You. See you all soon. Yeah, thanks, Christo. Always great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.